2014, Aaron Hedges was 38 years old, he lived in Montana, and he was an avid hunter. During the hunting season, Aaron was known to spend almost every weekend or every other weekend hunting in one particular area known as the Crazy Mountains, or the Crazies for short. The Crazies are a mountain range in Montana that are actually disconnected from the Rocky Mountains, so they're very isolated, and they're beautiful, but they're incredibly rugged and very steep. Aaron knew this area like the back of his hand because he was there all the time hunting. In fact, he was there so often that he began placing caches of sleeping bags, food, water. He cached this all over the crazies. And he knew how to get to his cache points without the use of a map. He just could look around and know where he was and he could walk to his cache point. On September 3rd, 2014, Aaron, along with two of his close friends, decided to go on a hunting trip to the crazies for a week. They planned on staying right next to this lake called Campfire Lake, but in order to get to it, they had to hike into the crazies. You could not drive a car to where they were gonna stay. So they got two horses and a pack mule, and Aaron loaded much of his gear onto the pack mule. And so they begin this hike up to Campfire Lake. In a little ways into this first day hike, the mule spooks at something and runs away. In the process of running away from them, it ditched all of their equipment all over the place and they couldn't recover it all. Now, after they gathered up what they could and got the mule back and continued their walk, Aaron decided he didn't feel like going to one of his cache points to try to retrieve an extra sleeping bag. And he said, I'm just gonna use whatever extra gear you guys have, I'll make do. And so they continue on, they get to Campfire Lake and they set up their camp. And for the first couple of days, everything is going just fine. On the third day, Aaron decided that, you know what? I could tough it out, but I'm just gonna go north to one of my cache points and get that extra sleeping bag and try to get a few other things that were lost and make my, my living arrangements a little bit more comfortable while I'm here. And so his two buddies, they know that Aaron is in this section of the crazies all the time. And so they didn't bat an eye when he says he's gonna go off on his own. It wasn't a very far distance to this cache point. They said, okay, we'll see you later tonight. So Aaron takes off and after a little while, one of his buddies, for whatever reason, uses his radio to reach out to Aaron. The Walkie talkies they were using had this LED screen that anytime you transmitted traffic on it, it would register your GPS location and transmit that to the person you're talking to. So when he hailed Aaron at about 10 in the morning after he had left to go up to his cache point, when Aaron radioed back, it showed up on their LED screen that instead of going north to this cache point, he had deviated and gone very far to the east. And he would say on the radio, Aaron would say back to them, hey guys, I got mixed up and I missed the turn to go up to the cache point. I'm trying to find the trail to get back to the cache point. But they expect him, based on what he said, that he was just going to turn and go to the cache point and come back to where they were at some point that night. But here's the first weird thing about this case. Aaron got turned around and basically missed the turn at this really obvious fork in the trail. If you go this way, you'll get to your cache. If you go this way, you'll end up where Aaron is. And it's the complete wrong way. And you know it's the wrong way because on your right-hand side, if you're going this way, there's gonna be a creek on your right. Whereas if you go towards the cache, you're going uphill and there's no creek. So for Aaron, in perfect weather conditions, to have missed a very obvious fork in the road that he knows well is a little bit strange. Not to mention where he showed up on their GPS when they talked to him on the radio, he was a ways down the wrong direction. He would have been next to that creek for long enough that he should have already turned around. It's like making a wrong turn and going 45 minutes to an hour in the wrong direction when you already know it's the wrong direction. Why are you still going that way? But his friends were not that concerned. They had just spoken to him on the radio. He's saying, I got turned around. They're expecting him now to show up a little bit later in the day, maybe in the evening at some point. So that night when he doesn't show up, they try radioing him and they can't get through to him and they decide that, you know what, it's not that easy to call authorities. They didn't have cell reception out there, and it would have been about a day's hike before they could even get to a place where they could call authorities. So they decide, let's just stay here tonight. He could show up at any point in the middle of the night, and tomorrow, if he's not here, we'll go looking for him. The next morning, his friends get up. This is on September 6th. There's no Aaron. So they head off in the direction of this cache, and they start looking for Aaron. And all day, they're calling for him. They're trying to radio him. Nothing, no sign of him. The following morning, on the 7th, they do leave the area. They give up on their hunting trip, and they head out of the crazies to contact authorities. 
Authorities launched this massive, massive search for Aaron. But as soon as they launch the search, this massive storm rolls in, dumping two feet of snow within the first 12 hours of their search. So they really weren't able to accomplish much in those first two days, which brings us to September 9th. One of the main areas that they were looking for Aaron was following that path that he had gone down, the wrong path away from his cache. They followed that path down along that creek and were looking for anywhere along the creek that he might have been. And there was this cliff that overlooked the creek. And on this cliff, next to a tree, they found Aaron's boots, neatly placed side by side as if put there intentionally. Next to his boots was a very obvious fire pit where someone had started a fire. In the fire pit was a cigarette container that was Aaron's brand. It looks every bit like Aaron had been here, smoked a cigarette, took his boots off for some reason, and had been sitting next to this fire. Also next to the fire was Aaron's camelback water bladder, as well as some of the straps that went to his backpack that had been burned inside of the fire pit. But there's no sign of Aaron or his remains anywhere near there. Also, the people who found the boots in the fire said that we were in this specific area over the past two days. This wasn't here. At this point, investigators believed that Aaron must have been suffering from severe hypothermia, where in severe cases, people are known to actually strip their clothing. And so searchers created a new search area based on his boots, thinking he had to have been at this fire pit smoking a cigarette. He took his boots off because he's got hypothermia and he wandered off, but he can't have gotten far. We're talking two feet of snow on the ground in rugged terrain and he's barefoot. But despite searching extensively in their new search area, they couldn't find Aaron or any sign of him. Nine months later, a family, the Rhines family, who lived near the base of the crazy mountain range, they were doing their yearly maintenance on their fence that went around their entire property. And one of the family members decided to take a break from the work and walk up into the crazies just a little ways up to just sit on the mountain and look out across the land. It was a beautiful view. And as he's walking up, he gets about a mile from the, the property itself and he spots an orange vest under a tree. And so he figures a hunter must have lost their gear. So he walks up and he sees that not only is there an orange hunting vest laying on the ground, but there is a backpack that would turn out to be Aaron Hedge's backpack leaning up against a tree as if placed there on purpose. Inside of the pack was Aaron Hedge's wallet and license along with a loaded gun and food and water. Next to the pack, there was this rock. And on the rock was a thermos that was open along with an open energy drink. As if Aaron had set his pack down and then sat on this rock and was sipping an energy drink out of his thermos. If Aaron had been sitting on that rock as it appears he was, you can clearly see the Rhine's property a mile away from you. It's right in front of you. It would be impossible not to see. Additionally, this location was six miles away from where Aaron's boots were found. So all of Aaron's gear is brought to the authorities who go out and they look for Aaron and there's no sign of Aaron in the area. Another year would go by and a couple of horseback riders would be riding past that same area where the backpack was found and they see a human skull sitting underneath a tree. Sure enough, it winds up being Aaron Hedge's skull and his skeletal remains were all there except for his feet. His feet were never found, but the coroner could not determine a cause of death. So a couple of questions come to mind. How did Aaron, a guy that knows the crazies inside and out, make that wrong turn in the first place? He should have known better. But even if we say he got turned around, it can happen to the best of us, he would have known he was going in the wrong direction because the creek would be on his right, but he kept going because we find his campsite with his boots way down the path that was in the wrong direction. But even if we're willing to accept that as why he was at that campsite, he took off his boots and then he walked six miles in two feet of snow to a location that was literally looking at safety. The Rhine's property is right there. You have food, you have water, and you're sitting there drinking a drink. You have a loaded gun, you can fire it into the air to try to get someone's attention, but you don't use your resources, you don't go to safety, you die. In 2018, Terrence Woods was a 27-year-old filmmaker slash journalist who had, ever since graduating college, traveled the world 
filming in locations that are very rugged and sometimes quite dangerous for these documentaries and TV shows that he was known to work on. In October of that year, Terrence was going to travel to Idaho with a production company called Raw TV. They were doing a TV series around an abandoned gold mine called the Penman Mine. Penman Mine was located in an area that is quite rugged in the middle of the backcountry. Terrence had previously worked on two different backcountry shoots. One was done in Turkey and the other was done in Alaska. So he wasn't an expert by any means, but he was accustomed to being out in the wilderness to do some of these shoots. Prior to leaving for the trip, he had texted a number of his friends and just said he wasn't really that excited about going on the trip. His friends would later say to investigators that his language was not alarming. He was just kind of complaining about not wanting to go on a particular work trip, so it didn't stand out to them at all. Terrence arrives in Idaho in early October. He texts his father to let him know that he's landed, he's made it to the hotel. Everything seems to be going normally. He was supposed to be there until mid-November, and that's what everybody in his circle was expecting. So on October 5th, when Terrence sent a text to his father that just said, I'm gonna be coming home on October 10th, and there was no explanation, his father wondered why. And so he wrote a response and said, why are you cutting your trip short? But he never got a response because Terrence had actually already left for the day on October 5th to go do a shoot at this mine and he'd be out of cell phone reception. On October 5th, the crew that was around Terrence all day reported that he was acting very strangely. He was very quiet, withdrawn, wasn't really talking to anybody. And at the end of the day, when they were wrapping up shooting, one of the producers was sitting in a vehicle waiting for everyone to kind of finish up packing up. And Terrence said he wanted to go relieve himself. And he walked over to the edge of this cliff. And for whatever reason, this producer, he didn't know why, but he just thought he needed to look to see if Terrence was okay. And he turns to look where Terrence was standing at the edge of this cliff and Terrence isn't there anymore. And he sees Terrence's radio is now sitting on the ground standing there. And there was just something about the scene that he saw that he instinctively knew something's wrong. And he actually ran up the cliff in case Terrence had fallen off of it. But when he got to the edge of the cliff and looked over, he was shocked to see that Terrence was down there about 15 feet down, but wasn't laying on the ground like he had fallen. He was sprinting down the hill, not saying a word, not looking up, running at full speed down the hill into the forest. The producer didn't know what to do. He kind of yelled to some other people and said, hey, what's Terrence doing? No one knew. And so the producer and somebody else also began chasing after Terrence. But after a little while, they, they couldn't catch up to him and they were worried that by chasing after him, they might scare him. And so instead they immediately go and they call authorities and this huge search is launched for Terrence. So for a week, you have all these people looking for Terrence. You have people on foot, you have dog teams, you have a helicopter with infrared technology. You have all these people combing this area and there's no sign of Terrence. One of the search and rescue officers commented that it would have been so hard to get away from the search because the ground inside of that forest was so covered with fallen trees that there were times where you were just walking on fallen trees. You weren't even touching the ground. And so the idea that Terrence could run in there and uh, effectively evade this massive search that had kind of encircled the area, it just didn't make any sense, but there was just no trace of him. And to this day, we have no idea where he went. There's never been a sign of what happened to Terrence. He just started running away for reasons we don't understand and disappeared. On the same day that Terrence Woods goes missing, 56 miles away in the same mountain range, a 76-year-old woman named Connie Johnson also goes missing under very strange circumstances. Connie was an outdoors woman through and through. She had previously worked as a wilderness ranger for the US Forest Service, and she was known to take young people out on trips along the backcountry and teach them how to survive. Her friends said that she had tremendous survival skills and spent much of her time alone in the woods. Connie was working as a camp cook for Ritchie Outfitters. It was a company that organized hunting trips in the Idaho and Montana backcountry. The camp that she was actually working at was not accessible by vehicle. You had to get there on foot or on horseback. On October 2nd, all of the hunters at the Ritchie Outfitters camp that she was working in left for a three-day hunting trip. They said bye to her and bye to her dog Ace, and they were gone. She was the only person at the camp. 
The following day, they got a very strange radio transmission from Connie. They couldn't understand what she was saying. They couldn't tell if she was mumbling or if there was something wrong, or maybe it could have been the radio. But when no one could understand what she was saying, they ultimately said, okay, I'm sure she's fine. And so a couple days go by and on October 5th, the hunting party returns to the cabin and Connie's gone as well as her dog Ace, they're both gone. All they could find was Connie's jacket was laying over her gun that was sitting on a picnic table. That was it. A very intense search was launched that included the National Guard, the Air Force, helicopters, dog teams, ground searchers. They couldn't find her or her dog. And so on October 16th, they called off the search. Three weeks later, Ace, her dog, would show up 15 miles away from where they had gone missing. The dog was emaciated, but was okay. They fed the dog, and then they tried to get the dog to help them find Connie, but to no avail. To this day, we have no idea where Connie went or why she left the camp to begin with. In February of 2008, the Pilkington family, which was David and Camilla, along with their two sons, Timothy and William, who was seven years old, were on vacation on the west coast of Vancouver Island. They were staying in this tiny little town called Tofino, which was at the end of one of the peninsulas on the island. There was maybe 20 streets in the town. There was only a handful of places that you could stay. Everybody knew everybody on the island. I mean, it was really a tiny place. One morning, David wakes up early and decides he wants to take both of his sons down to one of Tofino's beaches. And so he gets Timothy and William, they walk over and they go down this flight of steps that leads down onto the beach itself. And when they get to the bottom of the steps, William says he wants to stay at the foot of the stairs. Timothy wants to go actually walk around the beach with David. And so David couldn't convince William to come with him and with Timothy. And so he says, okay, William, you stay right here. I'm gonna go with Timothy for a couple of minutes and, and walk around the beach. So David and Timothy walked only about 10 or 15 meters away from William, who was just standing at the foot of the stairs, just watching his dad and his brother. And at some point, David would say that he turned his back on his son. He said it was maybe for a minute, and he was looking at Timothy and, and they were doing whatever they were doing. And then when he turned around, William wasn't there anymore. And so David instinctively runs over because there's nobody else down there. There's nowhere really for him to have gone, but he runs over, he's looking on the sides of the stairs. He can't find his son. You know, he's looking where he could have gone and it only made sense for him to probably go up the stairs. It wouldn't have been long enough for him to get into the water. It had only been about a minute he had turned his back. And so he goes up the stairs, he's looking around. He can't find his son in this huge search is launched for this boy because this just happened. It's a very small area. They figure they can find this kid. The main area they were gonna look was inside of the forest. Tofino had a very dense forest right in the middle of it. And since the beach butted up against the forest, they figured that the boy could have walked up the stairs and made it into the forest in that one minute that his father's back was turned. And so after an exhaustive search of this forest and there's no sign of him, unfortunately investigators began to look to the beach and were waiting for a body to wash up on shore because historically the only people that ever went missing in Tofino were either found in the forest or they washed up on the beach. Those are the only two places you can go. There isn't anywhere else you can go. But the boy never washed up on a beach and they never found a shred of evidence ever in the forest where that boy was, he just vanished. So unfortunately, like basically all of the missing 411 cases, you have a baffling set of circumstances with no clear resolution. We don't know what happened to these people and we probably never will. But that doesn't stop us from theorizing about what could have happened. So I'd love to hear in the comments and I'll get back to as many of you as I possibly can. If you wanna learn more about missing 411, I do have a playlist just called missing 411. Or what I would suggest is going right to the source. Check out David Politis and his book series called Missing 411. I provided links below of how to get his books. I've also provided his YouTube channel in the description as well. So please go check out David Politis and his team at Can-Am Missing Project. They're amazing. And it's why we have any of this information to begin with. On January 23rd, 2005, which is actually a day that is remembered by the people of New York as Black Sunday, Curtis Myron, who was a New York City firefighter, was trapped on the fourth floor of an apartment in the Bronx, blazing inferno. He, along with five other firefighters, are trapped on the top floor. There was no way out, and they elected to jump from the fourth floor. And unfortunately, Curtis, along with another firefighter, did not survive the fall. In addition to those two lives that were lost, another fire had broken out separately in New York the same day that claimed the life of a third firefighter. 
This was the largest loss of life for the New York City Fire Department since the September 11th attacks. Curtis's wife, Jeanette, and their two daughters, Angela, who was a young teenager, and Deneen, who was a little bit younger than Angela, they were inconsolable. And they never thought that their father, their husband, would not come home again. But they were faced with this horrible new reality where dad wasn't coming home. The Black Sunday tragedy, the loss of those three firefighters had become very high profile. And so news channels and media outlets were showing up at Jeanette's property, hoping to get an interview with she or her kids about what had happened and they were just not interested in that and so they felt very trapped inside of the house and the house itself had been built by Curtis he had literally built the house and so it was just a constant reminder of the sadness of this loss and at some point Jeanette just said to the girls I think we should move I think we just need a fresh start this is too much it's too much to be here let's just move and the girls were very eager to leave so Jeanette starts doing some house hunting and quickly she finds this nice little house on Long Island where they live but farther away from the city and it was sitting on an acre of land, which for the price that was being asked for it, it was unheard of. They went to the property and Jeanette could see that the house needed a ton of work. But all of Kurt's firefighter buddies were very eager to support Jeanette and her kids, and they offered to come by and actually help them do the renovations on the house. And so Jeanette bought the house, and very quickly, she and her two daughters moved in, and all of Kurt's firefighter buddies showed up and began this massive house renovation. I mean, they were basically tearing it down to the studs and rebuilding the whole house. Because of this massive renovation project, a lot of the doors and windows were not secured. And so at night, Jeanette felt really uncomfortable. So she went out and purchased seven cameras to fit on the outside of the house to monitor the property. And all of the cameras streamed to her laptop where she could watch them at any time. And so she found herself watching these cameras a lot on her laptop, just kind of reflexively watching what was happening around her property. And so one night, Jeanette's at her house, her kids are upstairs and she's got her laptop open and she's watching these these feeds from the seven different cameras. And she admitted that it was just kind of fun to watch the cameras. It felt, you know, kind of cool to see what was going on outside, but from the safety of your home. And she was watching one particular feed that was showing the edge of her property where there was this big forest that basically butted up against their property where there was a swing set in their driveway. And she was looking out at this big open front yard of theirs. And from the tree line, she watched a figure emerge in a, it looked like a man in a cloak, walk up to their driveway and walk a little ways down the driveway before stopping and staring up at the house. Jeanette was so caught off guard by what she was seeing that she didn't do anything. She just stood there watching this figure. And as soon as the figure had gotten there and was watching the house, it turned back around and walked back into the woods and vanished. It was late. Jeanette didn't know what she'd even seen. The cameras were not super HD, so she thought it must have been an animal or it was just a, an anomaly of the camera itself. So at the same time that Jeanette is looking at her laptop and she's trying to make sense of this figure she's seen, upstairs, the two girls are in their own bedrooms, which are on other ends of the hallway. Angela was laying on her bed with her back up against the wall and she's reading a book and she starts hearing tapping along the same wall that her back is against and she can almost feel it in her back. She puts her book down and sits forward and turns and is listening really intently to where the tapping had been coming from. And then she hears bang, 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 like someone's trying to get her attention. She gets right out of her bed and goes to her door. She opens it up and looks downstairs because from where her door opened, she could look into the living room on the first floor and immediately she saw her mom on her laptop. Her mom was not banging on anything and her sister was in her room and she was down the hall. And so that couldn't have been her sister. So she goes back in her room and she's thinking to herself, I'm, I'm hearing things. She puts her ear right up against the wall and as soon as her ear makes contact with the wall, she said it sounded like someone smashed the wall right on the other side of her ear, it causes her to freak out and she goes right into her bed and throws the covers over her head and she hides. What Angela didn't know is that down the hall, her younger sister, Deneen, had heard tapping as well, but her tapping sounds were not coming from the wall, they were coming from the door. And she thought her mom had come upstairs to see what she was doing. So she got up, walked to the door, opened it up, and there was nothing. She did the same thing that Angela did and poked her head down and saw her mom sitting on the couch. She looked down the hall and she saw that Angela's door was closed. It wasn't Angela. So she shuts the door and as soon as it shuts, 
she hears three distinct taps on the door. She opens it up again, there's no one there. She too runs into her bed and jumps under the covers. The girls would say in interviews that the tapping sounds continued periodically throughout most of the night, but at some point they both managed to fall asleep under the covers. The next morning, the girls go downstairs and they're in the kitchen and they tell each other what they had heard the night before. And they both start feeding off of each other because they both had this experience and didn't realize it. Angela would say to Deneen, yeah, I heard these tapping sounds. Deneen is picking up on her fear and she's saying, I heard tapping sounds. And the kids are really wound up. And that's when Jeanette comes into the kitchen and she sees her kids talking about something that seems really intense. And she goes, what are you, what's going on? What are you talking about? And they said, mom, we think something's wrong with the house. We heard tapping sounds last night. This happened to me, this happened to me. And Jeanette just says, guys, it's a brand new house. We aren't used to the sounds the house makes. I'm sure it's just pipes or you know, creaking floorboards or something. You guys are overthinking it. Don't worry about a thing, the house is fine. Over the following few days, some of the firemen that were helping renovate the house began to work on the basement. The basement was full of clutter. It was like whoever had lived there before had never taken anything out. Very old pieces of machinery and furniture and strange boxes and papers. And the first step to fixing the basement was just gonna be emptying it. And so the firemen were removing things from the basement when one of them, his name was Tom, he was one of Kurt's very good friends, Tom discovered that on the ground, underneath all the clutter was this large pentagram, which is a five pointed star inside of a circle that is almost always associated with satanic worship. Tom gets Jeanette to come downstairs and he shows her what's on the ground. And he says, what do you want me to do about this? And Jeanette said, paint over it. I don't want my kids to see this. But what Jeanette didn't know is that the kids had actually been playing outside over the past couple of days out in that forest in their property. And they had found a number of pentagrams carved into trees, into rocks, carved into the dirt on the ground. They were everywhere. They decided not to tell their mom because they didn't want their mom to worry. So they're both siloing information about these pentagrams all over their property. A couple of days later, Angela was going to be home alone for a few hours. And Jeanette had given Angela some chores, which included cleaning out the refrigerator. And so Angela's in the kitchen and she's got the fridge open and she's taking things out and cleaning off each of the different drawers. And she can't help but feel Feel like someone is standing behind her. She kept turning around and no one was standing in the kitchen, but she just could not shake this feeling that someone was behind her. And so she's looking at the fridge at one point and she's about to just give up on cleaning the fridge and explain to her mom that she would just do it later when all of a sudden she hears behind her this loud like explosion. She hears pots and pans and knives and forks clattering all over the ground. And she instantly turns around and every cabinet, every drawer has come flying open and all of their contents have come smashing onto the floor. She sprints up to her bedroom screaming and hides in the corner. Shortly thereafter, Jeanette comes home, she goes inside and she sees the kitchen is an absolute mess. It looks like someone had broken in and she starts screaming for Angela, thinking the worst. Someone's broken in. What happened to my daughter? She's running upstairs, screaming for Angela. She finds Angela curled up in the corner of her bedroom. What's going on? What happened in the kitchen? And Angela just could not put an answer together. She was so shocked by what happened. So Jeanette tells her to stay here. She runs around the house, making sure that no one's there. She gets her laptop, goes back to Angela, opens it up and she checks the footage. No one's in their house. No one's been near their house. All the while, Angela's just sobbing hysterically and finally after Jeanette is convinced that there has not been a home invasion she turns to Angela and she's like what is going on why does the kitchen look like this and Angela tried to explain what happened but it just didn't make any sense and so Jeanette was getting frustrated with Angela and saying did you do that down in the kitchen but when Angela didn't change her story and just looked terrified Jeanette started to see that Angela wasn't lying this incident really rattled Angela and Jeanette would comment in different interviews that it was at this point that Angela began to withdraw quite a bit. She was really upset about what had happened in the kitchen, but there wasn't really a good way to handle it. And so Jeanette didn't know what to say to her daughter. Angela didn't know how to talk about it. And so it was just this awful cloud in their life that they had this really intense thing happen, but there's just no explanation for it. A couple of days after the kitchen incident and the crew that had been clearing out the basement got to the point where they were ready to actually start tearing down drywall. And so as they start demoing the walls, they find hidden in the walls a journal. And it's this very old looking journal with some lace wrapped around it. And one of the firemen gives it to Jeanette and just says, hey, you know, I thought you might want to look at this. I don't know what to make of it, but it was in your wall. Jeanette opened it up and she began flipping through it and she saw a date that was 
1927. And she knew that was actually the date that this house was actually built. It seemed like this was a journal written by someone named Christina, who seemed fairly young. And as she's flipping through this journal, it, it really starts to take a dark turn when she sees diagrams of these ritualistic sacrifices of animals and of people that apparently were taking place in this house because the diagram clearly indicated that it was happening in the basement. And even weirder is there was this room that they didn't know what it was for in the basement that was underneath the stairs, that it wasn't really a closet. It was all cement on all four sides. It was like someone had put a, a pocket of cement underneath the stairs. And they always wondered what it was. And some of the diagrams indicated that some of the sacrificing was going on underneath the stairs in that room. Jeanette decides to keep the journal from her kids. She does not want them to know that this was found in the walls. A couple of days later, Angela is in her bedroom listening to music on her headphones. And at some point she thinks she hears someone call her name. She takes her headphones out. She goes to the door, opens up, looks down and says, hey mom, did you call me? And her mom's like, no. She looks down the hall and she can hear that her sister is showering in the bathroom at the end of the hall, so it wasn't her. And so, you know, Angela, she has a healthy fear of this house because of really the kitchen incident more than anything else. But she's thinking, okay, I must have heard something, not a big deal. So she goes back into her room and she sits down in her bed, but before putting her headphones back in, she hears someone say, get Deneen. And it's coming from in the walls. Immediately, she's terrified. Down the hall, she hears Deneen, who's in the shower, screaming bloody murder. Angela starts running to the bathroom to see what's going on with Deneen, right as Jeanette is flying up the stairs to go see what's going on with Deneen. They open up the door and Deneen is huddled on the ground, screaming about some person in the bathroom with her. And she kept turning around and no one was there. Jeanette would say when she saw her daughter, she looked so scared, she thought she was having a seizure. And Jeanette immediately grabs a towel, scoops up her daughter. She grabs Angela and they leave the bathroom. They go running into Jeanette's room and they get into Jeanette's bed and they're all huddled there. And Jeanette's trying to ask Deneen what she saw. And so Deneen finally says that she was in the shower and she heard someone saying her name and it sounded like a male voice. And she's just looking through the frosted glass and all of a sudden she sees a big hand land on the outside of the shower door. Jeanette felt so helpless. She had lost her husband. Her kids have lost their father. And there's all these strange things happening in the house. And Jeanette just felt like she couldn't protect them. It was around this time that Jeanette really felt like she should leave the house. But financially, they were really invested into this house. So it would have been very difficult to leave just financially. And then also, the amount of time and energy all the firefighters, all of Kurt's friends had put in to renovating the house and you know, gutting it and fixing it up. It was so much time and energy that she felt like she would be letting them down if she left. And she couldn't possibly tell them that the reason that she was leaving is because the house is haunted. And so she just felt trapped. A couple of days go by and everybody is just on edge in the house. Angela, Deneen, Jeanette, they don't like being there. And Angela just felt really cooped up when she was home and she was just scared of being in the house. And so one night she decides to go outside and just swing on their swing, which was on their front property. Jeanette is inside the house doing dishes where there's a window that looks out the front of the house where you can see this swing set. When she finishes doing the dishes, she takes her eye off of Angela for a moment and she walks into the other room to sit down on the couch. She grabs her laptop, she opens it up and figures she can keep an eye on Angela using the security camera that was pointing in that direction. So she opens up the program and she pulls up all the camera feeds and she's shocked 
when on the camera feed with Angela, she sees the same cloaked figure she had seen the first time she'd been looking at the live feeds, standing right behind Angela. And immediately she's up and sprinting outside, screaming for Angela. As soon as she gets outside, she hears Angela screaming for her mother before she's even seen her mother. And when she turns the corner, she sees Angela screaming in pain on the ground in front of the swing. And there's, there's no cloaked figure anywhere. She runs over and she can see that Angela's ankle has been badly broken or dislocated. And so she scoops her up and she said, what happened? And Angela said that somebody pushed me. Someone pushed me off the swing. And they go to the hospital and sure enough, she had dislocated and broken her ankle. When they got home that night, Jeanette opened up the laptop and reviewed the footage from outside. And she saw this figure walk out of the woods and the swing was right up against the woods. And it goes right behind Angela and appears to push Angela and then goes back into the woods. Jeanette called the police. She showed them the footage and they feel really bad and they, they can clearly see what happened. But there's no way to identify the figure that came out of the tree line. They just told them to be careful, don't go in your woods. And if you see this figure again in any of your camera feeds, call us right away and we'll come right over and we'll do what we can. So at this point, Jeanette is terrified. She can't protect her kids and she doesn't leave them really at any point. She's 24 seven in the same room with her kids. They're sleeping in the same room. And the only time she would leave them is during the day for very brief stints. And on one day, a couple of days after the swing incident, Jeanette needed to go to the pharmacy. And so Angela is going to be alone for about an hour and a half. And so her mom leaves and Angela is in her bedroom and she's sitting on her bed and she's listening to music. At some point, she thinks she hears banging coming from somewhere in her room. Now, at this point, Angela has been pretty shaken up after living here. She had the incident in the kitchen where everything flew out of the drawers and cupboards. She's been hearing tapping and banging sounds. She has her sister's story about the hand on the glass in the shower. She just got pushed off a swing by some cloaked figure. I mean, she's scared of this place. And so every sound is gonna terrify her. And when she started hearing that tapping sound, she took out her headphones. She looks over at her closet and she can see that the doors are rattling. She is so immediately scared that she gets off of the bed and goes underneath and tucks up against the side of the wall. She could actually see the bottom of the closet and she can see it's still rattling and she's tucked up against the wall. And as she's looking, the doors slowly slide open and she sees a figure walk out of her closet that must have been standing there the whole time that she'd been laying on her bed. She said this horrible smell filled the room and she said that it looked like it had human feet, bare feet but it was a totally dark figure. It was hard to really pick out if it looked human or not, but it began walking around her room and she believed it was looking for her. And she heard its footsteps as it walked all over her room. And at some point it walks into the hall out of her bedroom. And she's just laying there under her bed, hoping that it doesn't come back. And then when she thinks it's walked all the way downstairs, it goes quiet. And then she hears it running up the stairs, running into her bedroom, runs right in front of the bed. Its feet are aimed right at her. It climbs onto her bed. She can hear the springs condensing right above her. And she's looking out wide-eyed, holding her mouth. And all of a sudden its head appears looking down directly at her. And it's this dark face, sunken eyes. It looks like its skin is rotting off of its head and it's just staring at her upside down, looking directly at her. At this point, she screams and the figure goes back up onto the bed and now it's sitting right above her. She's screaming uncontrollably and then she hears it get off the bed, but she doesn't know where it went in the room. And so for the next 45 minutes, she lays there expecting this thing to come back. It knows where she is. It knows she's under the bed and she can hear it occasionally running around the house. She can just smell this horrible smell. And at some point she hears her mom's car outside and she starts screaming for her mother. Her mother must have heard her because she comes bombing into the house. She runs up the stairs. She's screaming for Angela. Angela is screaming for her mom. And then she finally finds Angela under the bed. She pulls her out and she holds her and she's trying to figure out what's going on. And Angela is saying that he's in the house. He's in the house. He's in the house. I don't know what it is. He came out of my closet. Jeanette runs all through the house looking for anything or anyone in the house. There's nothing. It's gone. At this point, Jeanette is at her wit's end. She doesn't know what to do. So she takes Angela, she gets in the car. They drive to where Deneen is. Deneen was with a friend at the time. They get Deneen, so the three of them are together now, and they drive to Jeanette's parents' house. 
And while they're there, Jeanette calls a paranormal investigator and she says, I need your help. I, I need help to get rid of what's going on in my house. And so she gets in touch with this woman named Liz who offers to do a cleansing of the house. And after the cleansing was done, Jeanette would say that it appeared that everything stopped in the house. And somewhat unbelievably, Jeanette and Angela and Deneen decided to stay in the house, in the house where this demon was, that they felt confident that the cleansing had gotten rid of it. And to this day, they still live there. If it was me, I would have been out of that house and never gone back. So I'd love to get your reaction to this story. Do you think there was some paranormal entity that was haunting them in the house? Or do you think this is just a product of extreme grief and anxiety as a result of the death of their husband and father? Or is it something else? Let me know what your theory is in the comments and I will do my best to get back to as many of you as I possibly can. If you enjoyed this video, then the next time the like button asks you to get them a regular iced coffee, go to Starbucks and get an iced coffee, but ask for light ice. And then hand that joke of a drink to the fool that is the like button. Also, please subscribe to my channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of my weekly three to four, even five video uploads I do every week. If you have a story submission, we have a subreddit just called Mr. Ballin. It's linked in the description below. You can post your story there. And if I intentionally use one of your suggestions, I will absolutely credit you. If you want to get in touch with me, you can direct message me on Instagram. My username is John Ballin 416 I also have a Twitter account that I really just